Uh, well, good morning uh, and a, a big welcome to you to this session today. Um, investing together to end grand corruption, um, a, a wonderful title, um, but really looking at how um, restitution as organisation combines asset management, litigation, funding and impact investment to return stolen patrimony to sovereign nations. Um, we're very, very pleased to offer this session this morning with Catherine Mulhern, CEO of Restitution, and Elizabeth Fisher, uh, Head of Investments. Um, just before we start, a word of thanks uh, to our sponsors. We're very fortunate for the FS Club to have uh, a range of sponsors who allow us to um, range pretty far and wide across the, uh, the fields of finance in uh, the economy, um, technology, science, uh, and other things that we all find very interesting. So a big, big thank you to our sponsors. Um, the programme for today is quite simple. Uh, we'll have a presentation from Catherine and Elizabeth uh, after I get out of your way. Um, and then there'll be time for Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. Um, by way of um, housekeeping, uh, first of all, today's session is being recorded. So um, if you want to go back and uh, re-watch it, or if you want to share it with friends and colleagues that you think might be interested, uh, the uh, recording will be posted on our website in the next couple of days. Uh, secondly, if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, the way to pose a question uh, is to use the dashboard uh, on your screen, you'll see the little question box and you can type in your question there. And when we get to the q and I'll field those for Elizabeth and Catherine's uh, comments. Put a question in at any time during the presentation, during the session. So please keep the questions coming um, and we'll address those uh, towards the end of the session. Um, so without any further ado, um, we'll move on to um, our speakers today. Um, Catherine Monathan, CEO of Restitution, Elizabeth Fisher, Head of Investments for Restitution, uh, Catherine, you're up first, I think. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. So it's very nice to meet everyone. Thank you for the time. So my name is Catherine Mulhern. I'm CEO of Restitution. I'm here with Elizabeth Fisher, who's Head of Investments. Um, our focus at Restitution is really looking at illicit financial flows and focusing on them as assets as opposed to a problem or an issue. So, uh, Sasha, next slide. So what are illicit financial flows? Essentially, they're an untapped asset class, potentially, but they're also a, a deep problem in the global financial centers and also in uh, developing countries in particular. So the focus for us is really looking at illicit financial flows as an asset class as opposed to an issue or a problem. And what are illicit financial flows? Well, effectively, they take up about 3% of the global financial system. So they take up 3% of the economy. And essentially what they do is they suck that out of the global financial centers and create a situation where you have um, uh, criminal states that take advantage of this. So essentially what we do is we look at this as an asset class and we develop these assets primarily focused with governments on how to develop them and essentially make them as an asset as opposed to a problem. So next slide. So what are illicit financial flows? So essentially there are trillion dollars of assets that are taken out of the global financial system per annum. And essentially what they are are not only an issue in terms of um, the global economy, but they also cause issues as well in terms of security. So the U.S. in particular has been quite focused on this, and the Ukraine situation is in fact partially a corruption issue as well as a strategic and security issue. So um, in terms of illicit financial flows themselves, there's about three, uh, between 30 billion and a trillion dollars of assets that are taken out per annum. And in the context of Ukraine, for example, um, the Ukrainian government has said there's between 40 and 60 billion that has been stolen from them. And Russia has used uh, corruption as essentially as a strategic way to undermine not only Ukraine, but also some of its neighbors as well. So for us, what we do is we look at this as a potential opportunity as opposed to a problem. And essentially what we do is we look at these assets, we value the assets, we work with governments, to try to create a situation whereby people can invest in these assets. And we use litigation funding 
as a, uh, essentially as the tools for us to help with these governments. In terms of the commercial piece of this, commercially litigation funding has been um, a part of the financial institutions for quite some time. So people have been investing in commercial litigation funding uh, for the last 15 to 20 years, but governments have never really taken advantage of this. So what we do is we actually work with these governments to develop these um, illicit financial flows as an, as an asset. We look at um, tort claims, breach of contract claims, and others. Governments themselves have really struggled to understand that these assets are something that are investable. And in fact, a lot of that is driven by how the governments see their balance sheets. So often for them, their balance sheets are really focused on tangible assets as opposed to intangible assets. So for us, what we do is we work with them to develop these assets, to create something that is investable for them and for investors, and allow them to start bringing these illicit financial flows back. So next slide. So just following on from what Catherine was saying, obviously there is a lot of money, there are billions of dollars left on the table. Um, you know, and the question is why, you know, why restitution and why have not the existing market solutions already been tapped into by these governments? Um, so as Catherine said, you know, litigation funding has been used successfully for now over a decade, and that's both for financing claims and also for asset recovery. Um, the, the market is also in, is increasing in size quite dramatically. So between 2013 and 2017, the use of litigation finance actually increased fourfold and is expected to grow to a, an $18 billion market in size by 2025. And it's really moved into the mainstream. You know, a few years ago, nobody would have heard of litigation finance. It was seen as a very niche area of finance. Um, but, but now, as I say, it is moving into the mainstream. Burford Capital, which is one of the largest litigation uh, funders in the world and uh, also listed on the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, commissioned a report which was issued a few days ago and they actually interviewed uh, general counsels and senior heads of litigation uh, across various industries, I think a total of just under 70. Um, and bearing in mind what I just said about the fact that a few years ago people would not have heard of litigation finance, over half of those who were interviewed uh, viewed legal finance as important consideration when they're looking at claims and they expect their law firms to be well versed in litigation finance and to be able to advise them on its availability. But first of all, let's just take a quick step back for those of you who don't know what litigation finance is and why we see it as a very, very good solution for sovereign states. So litigation funding is when a funder takes on the financial burden of pursuing a claim. Um, and the finance is actually non-recourse. Uh, and what that means is that the funder's investment and return are contingent on a client win. So effectively, the client is shifting uh, that risk off their books onto the litigation funder. And the funder is taking on all the downside risk of that claim. So the funder funds the claim. And of course, there is an a binary outcomes to that claim. You either win the case or you lose the case. And obviously, if you win the case, you also need to uh, not just get the judgment, but also secure the assets that underlie that judgment. Now, if the case is won, the client receives a meaningful upside of, of the returns on that case. Um, and the funder receives its money back and a return. If the case is lost, then the client loses nothing and the funder has assumed all of the costs of, of that piece of litigation. Now that funding can also take place at any stage uh, in the claim. So from the very earliest of actually uh, thinking about and bringing a claim all the way through to looking at a legal judgment or award where you're effectively, what you're doing is transforming those unenforced ju judgments and awards, and they could also be non-performing loans from legal paper into cash or as Catherine has referred to it as an asset, you're treating these as assets. So going back to the question of why it is that sovereign states haven't taken advantage of this particular tool so far, uh, and where restitution comes into the picture, you know, there's a number of reasons for this. And the, the, the primary one is that litigation finance is expensive. So, you know, if you think about the fact that this is not a loan, but a non-recourse money, where the funder takes all of the downside risk, the funder, a commercial funder, would expect to be taking up to 50% of the upside. That is expensive. 
And the, the optics for governments in that scenario are poor if they effectively win a case and they're handing over up to 50% of that commercial return to a commercial funder. Um, secondly, uh, the funder is really only interested in its return rather than, and we will get into this, this ongoing working relationship with the, with the governments. So they are not concerned about what happens to the return once it's handed back to the government, the risk potentially that some of the returns could go back into corrupt hands. Thirdly, uh, sovereign states are really have been focused primarily on criminal enforcement, and that is where their expertise lies. They do not have the generally the internal expertise and bandwidth to, to really think about potential claims against large corporates that are complex claims and complex pieces of litigation. Um, and therefore, they would be looking to external support to, to bring those forward. And finally, I mean, as I've just discussed at the beginning of this, you know, litigation finance, whilst it is moving into the mainstream, is still not well heard of. It requires education, education of sovereigns. And to, to be able to do that effectively, you really need to be able to understand how to work with governments, how to talk to them, how to navigate uh, that, that machinery. And, and clearly the, the needs of sovereign states are very different to those of corporate clients. So I'm gonna hand over to Catherine, who's gonna talk about in more detail why our approach is different and why it works for sovereign states. Thanks, Elizabeth. I think for us, the, the key is really understanding not only the economics and also the financial piece, but also understanding how governments work and and potentially what, what sort of um, issues they face, not only in terms of the economics and the finance, but also the political and the, and the policy. <clears throat> We've talked a little bit before about uh, the fact that uh, corruption is seen not only as a a sort of economic issue, but also as a policy issue and potentially a national security issue as well. For many countries now, where they are sort of in terms of the macroeconomic sense is that they are effectively running out of money with interest rates going up and also with the fact that there's tremendous debt overhang, particularly in the global south. The fact that um, also that quite a few from a policy perspective are dealing with issues and hangovers around things like um, development aid being cut uh, and also uh, dealing with, with sort of internal economic issues as well means that anti-corruption focus on assets and bringing these assets back is now becoming much more of a key focus for a lot of countries, particularly in the global south. So that combined also with the fact that in, from a accounting perspective, they're really starting to think about the fact that that these non-solid um, assets, these non-concrete assets are something that they can start counting, looking at potentially valuing, which is what litigation funding and the finance piece really brings. And then also that they can invest side by side with investors, which is how we structure these returns, is something that's becoming much more attractive from them, from, for them. I think for us, um, as a result, we really bring more to the table than just the finance piece, although the finance and litigation piece is extremely important. Valuations and litigation funding are complicated and potentially uh, evolving because the industry itself is evolving. But there needs to be development focus and impact focus as well. Policy and human rights are a key um, aspect of some of the work that we do. Um, so it's not just a litigation or, or finance piece, but it's more holistic than that. And what we're finding with these countries is they themselves need this because it's really the language they speak is policy, it's politics, it's, it's human rights and it's development. And for us to be able to get into a room with someone and explain, and, and these people are incredibly sophisticated, particularly around things like uh, litigation and also around the finance piece, but to be able to say, okay, this piece of the puzzle is something that you can bring back and potentially redeploy to pay teachers, to develop a, an education or a healthcare fund to deal with climate change. That holistic approach is really the approach that allows us to work with these governments effectively. And we think from uh, the work that we've done in the past, that straight finance or straight uh, litigation uh, is very important, but it's got to be one of the pieces of the puzzle. And so that's what restitution brings. So we have development professionals, professionals, human rights professionals, and others on staff who go with us and really develop sort of holistically th this approach, which 
starts from uh, investigations all the way through the asset recovery and return. So next slide. And in terms of the work that we do, in a sense, not only do we work with governments holistically, but we also work with investors holistically as well. So and we work with donors and foundations too, who work with us to help develop these claims. So if you think about it from a, almost a life cycle, not only of, of the work that we do with governments, but the claims themselves, which are the asset, we get involved very early in the process. And really we have to, because in many ways, the, these assets, these claims are things that um, governments themselves can use support on, but also need help in terms of investigating and shaping. So donors work with us to do that. And there's a capacity building element to the work that we do too, which is very important. But in many ways, that capacity building is more knowledge sharing. So we work with prosecutors, we work with ministers of justice, and also minister of finance and others to really develop a claims portfolio to the point where it's, it's investable, which means that we've um, we found the targets, we've developed the claim to the point where an investor will look at it and say, absolutely, and we'll look at it and say, okay, this is now commercially investable. So donor and seed funding is a key part of that. Um, we also look at capital guarantees. So essentially what we do is we work with donors and also the commercial market to develop something where downside risk is really um, protected in exchange for which a donor may get a, and, and or an insurance company or others may get a slice of the upside. And we should talk a little bit about the value of these claims as well. Elizabeth will talk a bit more about this when she talks about the process, but the claims themselves are intensely valuable. So you know, for six to 10 million in terms of investment, you get potentially 100 to 150 million upside. And that's why litigation funding is so popular, particularly popular with the private sector. It's also a non-correlated asset as well. So as a result, you get a lot of interest, not only from private investors, but other investors and insurance companies too. And then in terms of um, the recoveries themselves, they're very similar to what litigation funders and, and litigators have been working on in places like um, the UK, the US and Australia, where litigation funding is very well developed. So um, uh, in terms of, of global realizable recoveries, it becomes very, um, not bog standard, because doing asset recovery work is not, is usually fairly complex, but it, it becomes something that the industry is used to seeing and litigators are used to seeing. But then the last piece of the puzzle is we really work with these countries to say, okay, once these assets are returned, but in line with your thinking and your views of, of things, how do we then use these assets in such a way that it has maximum impact? And we've talked a little bit about this before, but things like um, you know, education funds, sovereign wealth funds, help, helping really the countries to take it to the next level and also working with them to see if we can uh, develop a further sort of investor base. So the next turn could potentially be quite uh, interesting, not only for investors, but also for the countries themselves. So we're really looking for you know, strength, strengthening the investor relationship that they have with, with various investors and creditors, and also diversifying their own economies as well. So this feeds into that too. So next slide, Sasha. I'll hand over to Elizabeth for this one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this is obviously a very, very simple uh, diagram to demonstrate how we how we operate. Obviously, there is a lot that goes underneath this. But as Catherine said, you know, the first thing we're doing is really building out these early stage claims. Um, you know, we're building relationships not just with governments, but also those in those in opposition. Uh, we've got extensive networks within within the countries, which really helps us to be able to identify some of this low hanging fruit um you know so so first of all we are looking to uh build those relationships with governments we're looking to educate them and then investigate potential claims and when we're looking at these claims we are using some of the similar or same criteria that a commercial funder will use we are looking at bringing you know the large claims we are not looking at bringing claims against individuals uh, small individuals with with small kind of bribery type claims these are the very large complex corporate claims 
um, that uh, will also result in a huge return uh, if successful. So, um, you know, for example, as Catherine said uh, regarding the the kind of the legal cost of bringing these claims, we're effectively looking at at least a multiple of ten times when we're looking at the the total es estimated legal costs of bringing the claim all the way through to a judgment. Um, and then looking at potential quantum, i.e. the recovered money of at least 10 times that. And because the sovereign states have not uh, looked at this option before, we're finding that there are some very large opportunities that, that sit um, within effectively their portfolio of potential claims against large corporates. Uh, and also these corporates quite often have been uh, seen across uh, various parts of the globe to be doing similar things, a very similar fact pack patterns uh, for these bad actors uh, and often brought to justice in, in, in other jurisdictions that enable us to really determine if this is a good case or not. Um, we are also able to bring out um, build these cases, as Catherine mentioned, using both donor grants, but also pro bono support from our advisors who are also heavily interested in looking at and building out these cases. So the point at which we're really looking to inject a serious amount of, uh, of money into effectively bringing these claims and advising, getting advisors on board, we've really effectively qualified the claims. So we believe that there is, there's real merit in bringing these claims. Um, and that effectively reduces the cost of capital uh, in, in taking these claims forward. Those claims are then transferred into a country specific recovery fund. So effectively what that means is that the country has uh, a, an entitlement to a percentage um, of the return, we mentioned this earlier, the percentage that we offer the country is significantly higher than that offered by a commercial funder. Uh, and that is one of the attractions of our model. Um, but equally, we get a right of first, first refusal and exclusivity around certain claims or claims within a certain industry, which enable us to identify those large claims which effectively create the returns are required to ensure that there is a proper return for both the investors and the governments. Um, as I said, these claims are transferred to us. So that means we run the claims, we manage them, and we know and have a network of advisors. We know the best investigators, lawyers, lawyers, PR firms, asset recovery experts in the industry to know how to successfully bring these claims to ensure that we have both strong re uh, returns and also operate a high level of efficiency throughout these claims. You know, our, our interests are very much aligned with that of the governments. We are looking for uh, early returns of, of money, uh, often looking at uh, very early stage settlement strategies to ensure that we get the money back in the coffers as soon as possible. Um, and then the, the, we get the proceeds back. Uh, and I should say that we are really looking at some of the kind of the, the key jurisdictions that we're looking at are, are, are those which are uh, which we know will will result in you know the, the best opportunity for us to recover the proceeds, uh, you know, the likes of England and Wales, uh, the US, etc. So, so what that means is there is a, a real alignment between our investors, the governments, and restitution capital. So for the investors, we have uh, you know, this access to this untapped pipeline of cases um, with a right of first refusal. Um, and this is a, a you know, pipeline of cases, which as I said, commercial funders do not get access to. Um, and it results in an opportunity to really see some, some very big opportunities. Uh, with this funding, early stage funding from donor grants and pro bono support, and as I said, full autonomy to, to run these claims. Uh, and for investors, the opportunity to invest in an uncorrelated asset class. For the benefits for the government, um, you know, they are talking to us because they can now feel comfortable that they can outsource these sensitive and costly claims um, whilst knowing that they are going to uh, get an economic entitlement, which is of a much higher percentage, the lion's share of those net recoveries. So absolutely uh, aligning the interests alongside um, sophisticated investors. And as Catherine mentioned, this is very much a collaborative approach, thinking not just about the claims, but in supporting the governments uh, in deploying capacity building uh, to, to ensure that we are further strengthening their ability, their independent ability uh, to uh, pursue cross-border asset recovery, asset management and redeployment of these large financial flows. And the final point, uh, is that these recoveries are used in a way, and we structure this in a way so that they are used transparently and with impact 
and Catherine's going to talk for a couple of minutes on what that looks like. Yeah, next slide, Sasha. Thank you. So, well, we've talked a little bit uh, about this, but probably worth emphasizing again that a, a lot of the work that we do holistically is really working with the governments essentially to come up with an approach which which is end to end and what that looks like in practice is really working with the governments to say okay these are the assets these are the valuations that you're looking at how can we help redeploy those assets in a way that protects them from re corruption and ensures transparency and accountability in practice that's quite light touch because the governments themselves really from their national priorities to to their development plans will have their own views in terms of how it is that they want to deploy these assets. And given where we are again in terms of the, the sort of economic environment and the economic turns around debt, and because debt is becoming increasingly scarce, these sorts of assets are becoming more and more important in terms of ensuring the legacy of governments, um, particularly governments who are perhaps going into a uh, so democratic cycle or looking at election cycles. So how do you deploy assets in a way that has maximum impact for the people is very important. And what that means practically can be anything from setting up a stabilization fund, which can protect from the shocks to the economy, to looking at an education fund, to potentially also creating something where it's direct support. So one of the things that we've been looking at with one government is ways to potentially demine a country. So typically demining, which is to take mine, landmines out of a country that has historically been fragile or sort of in a situation of war, costs hundreds of millions to do, but the impact can be tremendously uh, positive. So anything from impacts to agriculture, um, to creating a, a situation where environmentally things are in a, in, in a better position to create also, um, creating sort of economic impacts in terms of tourism. All of those things potentially flow from that uh, one act. So, and 500 million, 600 million in terms of asset recovery is imminently doable. So you can get a demining organization to demine a country, which would allow it then to, from an economic perspective, to start to diversify. So it can really change the course of a country's economic life. So those are the sorts of projects that we work with with governments on. And it can be that too, as simple as potentially providing balance sheet support or looking at ways to repay or restructure debt. So all of those things are, are things that we work with the governments on. And to be honest with you, that sort of work they welcome because from their perspective, having this in such a way that it sort of cycles back in, into the economy brings more investors in and also allows them to say, look, we're very serious about anti-corruption, which from a policy perspective is becoming increasingly important, is something that, that these countries welcome. But we should also say that we're very cautious about telling, what these, telling these countries what to do. It is their money. And Elizabeth has mentioned this before, it's really returning their money to them, but then working with them in a way that sort of ensures transparency and breaks the architecture of corruption. So, I think that's it. We went over time slightly, I think. Yeah, just a, a final piece, just on, in terms of invest, the investment itself, given the focus on ESG and the SDGs, there's very few sort of G-focused investments, governance-focused investments, and also SDG 16 as a potential investment opportunity is something that, that is quite strong with our investors. And that's us. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is an area which um, I didn't certainly know much about before we came into the <clears throat> planning for this session. And I suspect that might be true for some of the audience. Um, Edwina Morton uh, is with us. She's got sort of two questions. Um, first of all, given the scale of the problem in some parts of the world, how do you figure out um, which, rest, which restitution claims are investable? investable? Um, and do you focus predominantly on geographically or sectorally? So that's the first question. How do you, you know, narrow down which, which claims to pursue? 
The second question is, are there some claims that are impossible to, to pursue? In other words, you know, in some countries, geographically, um, there may be very little chance of actually getting the money back. Um, and so are there some places where you simply find yourself not able to do business? Yeah, uh, I'll t if I can take the first, uh, second question first, and then Elizabeth, do you want to take the first question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So because the, this particular tool is quite a powerful one, one of the things that we do is at restitution is really look um, at the countries themselves. We work with countries that pass, pass is probably a strong word, but we diligence our partners. And we really look at ways to work with countries that are moving in the right way in terms of transparency, indices, our, you know, fairly open, we, we speak a lot with civil society. Often our claims come from civil society. So we'll get phone calls from civil society partners who say, um, we've seen this, this has been going on for a while, we've, we've got concerns, we've done some reporting on it. And this is, is something that we think could potentially be a, uh, something that you could look at. So that's often where we get some of our first claims is that introduction. But um, but we are quite cautious about the partners that we work with because this is quite a um, powerful tool. So and there are some places where we wouldn't work for a variety of reasons. You know, if if the, the government really isn't willing to sort of work holistically on this sort of approach, or th there are issues in terms of transparency, accountability, treatment of civil society, those would be the sorts of things that would warn us off. Yeah, and in terms of the first question, in terms of how we think about which claims to bring, um, I mean, first of all, you know, we certainly don't go after everything that we could potentially go after. We've got a very kind of actually quite a narrow um, set of criteria that we use to really think about these claims. So I think, as I, as I mentioned, we're not going after the small claims. We're not going after uh, claims against generally against individuals where, you know, it might be sort of the bribery of, of you know, a few hundred thousand here and there. We'd never get a, a return that would, it would would basically satisfy both our investors and and the sovereign states. So we're going after the really large claims. The question around industry or sectoral focus is a good one because we 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 absolutely do that. There are a couple of very specific industries that we've already started to identify where we can see a pattern of behaviour uh, and frankly a, a set of previous cases. You know, a lot of there's a lot of public information out there where we can see that fines have been awarded against certain large corporates for certain sort of bad behavior uh, across the globe. And effectively what we're looking at uh, when we're bringing these claims is also thinking about how we can build these claims quite often across multiple corporates, so effectively building out a playbook that you know, once we've uh, had success with against one corporate for a particular type of behavior against the country, that we can apply that across the board. Um, the other thing is just some of the kind of classic um, criteria that a commercial funder would use to think about these claims. We need to make sure the return is, you know, at least 10 times that of the, the, the um, expected legal cost to ensure the right uh, type of return uh, across the board. We're also looking at duration risk. You know, we need to make sure that we can get the return as quickly as possible. We need to look at things like enforceability. Um, you know, if we got a successful judgment, that's never the end of the story. Um, you know, quite often these corporates will not pay up. Where are their assets located? How, how can we go over those, after those uh, assets? So, as I say, we're quite often looking for jurisdictions uh, which, you know, are not these sort of unusual jurisdictions, but making sure that there is a nexus to a jurisdiction where we believe we'll have the greatest success. So, there's, there's quite a few um, factors in there. But, yeah, we're very much kind of cherry picking a handful of cases where we think the return and the effort is worth it. Thank you very much. Um, Hugh Purses, um, going back to the beginning of the presentation, just asking how is the 3% uh, figure, um, it, 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 this sum as a proportion of the total financial system calculated? Uh, and the second part of this question, does this ex exclude financial flows from international organized crime? Um, or how does that fit into the, in, into the money? Yeah, so the, actually the 3% comes from the US State Department, who's been a quite, and, and the White House, who's been very focused on this post uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, um, so those numbers include things like uh, serious and organized crime, terrorism financing, uh, and other types of financing. So it's everything that goes into that bucket would include that. But um, I think from their perspective, uh, the donor governments have really woken up post 
the invasion to really look at what they term strategic corruption, which is using corruption to um, to destabilize. I think they're seeing that as a tool in the toolbox of certain actors, which is uh, is concerning them quite a bit. But yeah, it's a White House white paper. It came out about six months ago. That's great, thank you. Um, Alexander Rottenberg um, and Clive Bullen have said, have you got any sort of real life examples or examples of successful claims um, that people might know about or be able to you know, look into? Yeah, I mean, that there are a couple. The one MDB claim is probably the, the most uh, successful recent claim. But then there are also a series of claims that the government of Kazakhstan ran about 10, min uh, 10 years ago. Where they set up a foundation to called the Bota Foundation, which essentially accepted return of these assets. The assets were small, but uh, but the impact in terms of the foundation was quite significant. It was quite large. So in terms of of claims themselves, one MDB is probably a good one to look at. And in terms of you know, structured return, the Bota Foundation was quite successful. But we should mention that a lot of these claims are really things like breach of contract or tort claims. So that the claims themselves are fairly standard. And interestingly, um, particularly for asset recovery claims, that often um, high net worth divorce cases are very similar to a lot of these claims. So uh, looking at assets, finding where assets have been hidden, that sort of work has been done quite successfully and also commercially investable quite successfully over the last 10 years or so. Um, Clive's also asked, um, what can be done to stop the problem in the first place? Or you know, is, is part of your work focused on actually changing the system? Well, I think for us, a, a key part of the, the work that we do and, and uh, is, is to look at ways to sort of drive, um, uh, drive these sorts of claims where you're looking at numbers that could potentially sway certain actors to rethink some of their approaches. So uh, for those of us who've worked in the city, we often know that um, boards are really driven by risk and risk is really defined by the bottom line in many ways. So we think this is a tool, it's one of many tools in the toolbox. So, and we shouldn't um, in any way, shape or form say that criminal prosecutions and that you know, sort of building transparent and accountable civil society uh, ecosystems and also working on things like legislation, driving transparency is very important. But there are assets that are still stranded. It's interesting, and the Angolan government has come out and announced that there's about 100 billion of assets potentially sitting in global financial centers, which are uh, assets that were taken by the previous government and, and sort of bad actors around them. And those sorts of numbers sitting in global financial systems essentially feed the beast. So somebody asked the question about um, serious and organized crime and also uh, other types of financing. Once those assets sort of go into the system, they very easily then go from sort of gray into into grayer areas. It's not unusual for these assets to then be used for terrorist financing and for serious and organized crime. So draining that and bringing that back so it can be redeployed is going to be a very important tool in the toolbox. Thank you very much. A question, I guess, from me. Given the instability of some of the regimes um, and, and the countries in which you're working, um, how do you mitigate the risk of a change in regime? You mentioned, I know you talk to opposition politicians as well, but um, how do you mitigate those risks? A lot of it's around the structuring. So the structure itself is really set up, as, as Elizabeth has mentioned, as a fund. So and and these assets are monetized through the fund. So in in a sense they are and and we've done this really because the governments themselves have asked that there be a little bit of separation from them and some of these claims portfolios. So they're really structured to be in a sense separate and and done in a very commercial, very sort of arm's length way. So that's part of it. But then there are also other potential approaches, including looking at you know, Donors often work sort of in the ecosystem to ensure that things move forward in a certain way. And to be honest with you, most parties, even in opposition, say this is very important for us because the macroeconomic environment has moved so much that there's really no more donor funding. There's no development funding. And, and the debt side of the equation is really looking increasingly drastically bad. So uh, as a result, we think from a macroeconomic perspective, this timing is good. But 
I mean, you could end up in a totally different situation where, for example, in Afghanistan, something similar happened where you, you got a regime that said, you know, we're not doing any of this. A lot of this is contracted. So then potentially those funds would would be uh, sitting in a fund, but then could be redeployed as and when things change again. Thank you. Um, Deo Ajari Obi has asked um, whether you might also focus on climate sustainability issues, um, such around fossil fuel spills, um, other environmental you know, harm done by large corporates. Um, is there an, another asset class here that you might pursue at some point? Well, potentially, it could be a similar um, extension of the same work, because what we find is is those bad actors who commit certain corrupt acts will also be you know, potentially environmental polluters. There's, there's, there are connections here. They, they could treat communities badly. It tends all to be in the same eco sort of family of, of bad actions. And we, we talk a little bit about this as sort of a, not necessarily getting slightly away from the finance and investment piece, but from a, a investigation side, often we see a actor once you sort of see one bad action, it's almost like every decision is the, the bad decision, if that makes sense. So there, there are ways then that that could be sort of wrapped into claims around a fraud or unjust enrichment claims. And in terms of the asset return, so the cleanup piece of this could be wrapped into, um, into the asset recovery return and redeployment. Thank you very much. Um, just just the last question, I think, before we come to an end, can, can you describe a bit more about um, who are, who are your investors or what types of investors who are likely to uh, want to come on board? So it's it's everyone from those who are extremely interested in the space and have a lot of sophistication in the space and uh, litigation funding to those who are ESG or SDG focused. So there are ESG buckets of for certain investors who they would like to be able to deploy. And those who are looking for SDG 16 in particular have an, have an interest in this. And then there are those who are you know, larger, who are just getting into the, the space. So, and this is where donor government guarantees and insurance becomes interesting because Essentially, they can dip their toe in the water, their their profit gets flattened, but the downside risk essentially becomes um, pretty negligible, actually. So, uh, so it's a it's a fairly broad church. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think probably the other thing is just you know also high net worth individuals who are interested in this space as well. So it is a very very broad uh, set of potential investors. Super. Um, <clears throat> we're going to come to an end. Um, Hugh Purse has said he'd be most grateful for a link to the White House white paper that you mentioned in passing. Oh. About to sort that out after the after the event, and we can get that out in a follow up email to um, the audience. Um, but that would be great. Um, so many many thanks for that. It's been a fascinating um, overview of um, a, you know, a niche but important um, area of investable finance. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors. As I said, we're we're so grateful for them for allowing us to continue this program of work um, and to bring uh, events such as this one um, to a wider audience. Um, we've got some uh, exciting things coming up. Um, tomorrow we have a webinar focusing on Genoa. Um, and you know, we do try, try to look at what's going on in terms of the uh, financial world. Um, and that's an opportunity to find out a bit more about the developments in Italy. Um, on Wednesday, strategy in action, how to own, develop and execute your own strategy. Um, and next Tuesday, next week on Tuesday, uh, why the UK needs a written constitution. So again, ranging far and wide across uh, fields of interest. Um, do keep an eye on the uh, website for forthcoming events. Um, and so just remains for me just to say thank you, first of all, to you, the audience, uh, for turning up and for your engagement and questions. Um, secondly, major thanks to Catherine and Elizabeth um, for their time and their presentation this morning. Um, we really are grateful to you and um, we wish you all the best uh, going forward. Um, and normally I'd be able to throw open the floor for a large round of applause on a webinar. We can't do that, um, but <clears throat> I'm sure the audience would like to join me uh, in thanking you. Uh, on this occasion. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll see you all again uh, at another occasion. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.